morning. It is great joy to fellowship with you today and wish you a happy new year. We're so blessed to come to the Word of God again and come back to our study of the book of Matthew. Just a brief overview, if you're new with us or if you don't remember very well, which is most of you, Matthew chapters 1 to 4 are the introduction or giving us the identity of the Messiah. Just so you know, I had to remind myself of these things as well. Chapters 5 through 7, Jesus, of course, has launched his ministry. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He is preaching a sermon to his disciples whom he takes up to a higher place on the mountain and gives them truth. We studied that. We are in the middle of the third part of the book of Matthew. And these are truths that Jesus takes and applies to human lives. The the gospel truths as applied to human hearts really is what this is all about. And what we've discovered in this section is that Matthew records for us three groups of three signs. The first group of three signs, and he gives a little application. Then another group of three signs, and he gives a little application. We've seen those two. We are now at the third group of three signs or three wonders. Perhaps you didn't know how organized uh, the gospel writers were. Maybe you've read the gospels and just thought they sort of kind of sat there and thought of what came next and they wrote it down. No, they were very organized. They were very purposeful. They had objectives in mind. And Matthew had some objectives in mind pertaining, as it pertains to applying gospel truths to the heart of man. And we see these in these, this trio of triple signs. And we're at that third group of signs at the first sign there we're going to look at today. It's the healing of two daughters. They're both called daughters in this passage. And so these are two daughters healed. And this sign, this, this miracle, or these, this pair of miracles is going to pair up, is going to go along with the next set and the next set. And Matthew's going to give us some application, and there's an overarching theme we're going to look at. And I'll talk a little about that today and then jump into the study of this text. But first, let me read the text, follow along. I'll read it out loud. It begins in verse 18 of Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verse 18. And I'm going to go down to verse 26. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died. Come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I touch his garment, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him. And when the crowd had been put outside, he went and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all the district. This is the word of God. I was reading a book this week and came across the familiar story of a very famous Swiss man, came from the eastern side of Switzerland, a man by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. I bet some of you have heard about Zwingli before. Zwingli was born in 1484 and his his family was very devout, they were very religious and, and raised him up to appreciate all things religious. Of course, in that day in Western Europe, everybody would have been uh, Roman Catholic, and, and so he did what every good religious little boy would do. He, he submitted himself to become a priest. He studied for many years, and eventually he became a priest in a little village called Glarus, and for 10 years he served there as priest. Well, a couple of things happened while he was serving there as a priest that really changed the course of his life and eventually would change the course of all of Switzerland, really all that that part of Europe. The story of Zwingli and what happened to him really 
is a story of Swiss history. Well, what happened? Probably many different things happened, but the author I was reading pointed to two very specific things. One, Zwingli uncovered a pretty dark reality of the activities of some of the priests that were around him. He, he discovered, in fact, one priest, a friend of his, who was having relationship with a young girl in his parish. And then as he began to peel back and look and inspect, he began to find more and more of this activity happening, so much to the point but that he got a little bit disenchanted with the church and the priesthood and what was happening and, and the kind of practices they had in place. And this was, this was a deep, deep thing for him and, and really caused him a lot of turmoil and, and frustrations. And, and, and just so you know, I'm not trying to, to badmouth the Catholic church. Catholic theologians, in fact, I was reading a Catholic theologian this very week, they very openly and honestly acknowledged that this was a very dark period of, of their history. There was a lot of corruption in the Catholic church particularly in that day. In that day, they would oftentimes buy their positions. They would go raise money in various ways and, and purchase their role as priest or cardinal or bishop of certain areas. All sorts of problems going on, and he began to discover these things, this abuse of power. Of course, uh, priests would have been extremely powerful. The church was intertwined with the state, and the priests would have been extremely powerful in that day and age. And Zwingli began to look into all of this, and he figured this out and got a bit disenchanted with the Catholic Church. The other thing that happened to him is he himself began to discover some corruption in his own heart. Now, no, he was not engaged in, in that kind of sin. He was not engaged in the kind of sin that he had been discovering, but, but he was growing more and more convicted of his own heart, of the little sins, the petty things that he sort of put away and ignored. He began to realize there was a great chasm between himself and God. He was anything but holy. It was in this time that Zwingli picked up a Greek New Testament. Now, this is remarkable because in those days, that was just unheard of. A, a, a Bible in uh, spoken language, anybody's spoken language was unheard of. The Bible was always kept in Latin, and that was so that the church could properly interpret. No, it wasn't in the language of the people, and, and it certainly was not in the original languages. You wouldn't find uh, the New Testament in Greek. That's the original language that the New Testament was written in, and you, and you wouldn't find that anywhere. Even though these, these uh, Catholic theologians would have learned a little bit of Greek in their training as priests, you wouldn't find a Greek New Testament. But there was a, a man by the name of Erasmus that sat down and decided to look at all the manuscripts and put them all together and assemble a, a Greek New Testament, a, a New Testament in the language of the original, the language that it was written in. And Zwingli began to study this. And he began to work on the Scripture, or rather the, the Scripture began to work on him and open up his eyes and open up his heart and finally he realized he was not indeed a true believer. He was a false believer. He had never repented of his sin. He had never trusted in Christ alone. He was trusting in all this religion. He was trusting in all this ritual. And he realized the only freedom he could find from sin is to repent and turn to Christ and Christ only for salvation. Christ is the only one who was perfect, who provided the righteousness that would be to provide him access to God. He's the only one that provided the payment to pay for his sin, and so he turned to Christ and trusted in Christ alone. Well, Zwingli began to study this. He began to preach the Bible. He actually began to do something radical back then, and that is to go through the Bible and preach it verse by verse. He was moved to a chapel a little before this all happened, moved to a chapel in, in uh, uh, Zurich, which is the main city, and he got to, to preach to many, many people, and he began to just open the Bible and preach it in their language so that they could understand it. Now, this was radical back then. Even though Western Europe back then was Christian, quote-unquote, you would be born and be baptized almost immediately and be considered a Christian. Many people, in fact, most people could live their whole lives and hardly hear any Scriptures in their own language. And here was a man who would stand up, read it in their own language that they could understand, and then teach it. And this was radical and thousands and thousands of people. In fact, many priests listening to Zwingli heard what he had to say, and they themselves had the same transformation, salvation, 
And they began to go back into their parishes and do the same thing. They began to preach verse by verse. This was the beginning of, of the Swiss Reformation. Really, revival swept all across Switzerland. People realizing the gospel, hearing the gospel for the first time, understanding the gospel. Thousands, perhaps even, we don't know the real number, but perhaps hundreds of thousands of people, of thousands of people would come out and here's Zwingli preach the Word of God. It's by no stretch of the imagination that we could say he was the most famous Swiss preacher ever. He joined Luther. Luther was in Germany leading the German Reformation. John Knox was in, in England or Scotland reading the, leading the Scottish Reformation. John Calvin was on the French side of Switzerland leading the French Reformation. And he joined these figures as a leader in this great revival that swept all of Western Europe. Even today, still one of the most famous people from that era. None of us can really name anybody from that era. Maybe we can think of some of those reformers, but we don't know who the popes were. Leo, Adrian, Julius, we don't know their names. Unless you study Christian history, you don't really know who they are. You don't really know the principal figures in that day outside of these People, Ulrich Zwingli is one of the most famous people ever, most popular people ever in Switzerland. And let me ask you a question. You've heard the story. I, I've told the story of Ulrich Zwingli as best as I can. Based upon what you've learned in these short moments, was Zwingli interested in fame or in simply calling people to faith in Jesus Christ? He was interested in, in, in calling people to faith. I think Zwingli would have died had the people not listened to him and they persecuted him and killed him. I think he would have died continuing, continuing to preach the Word of God so that people would be transformed as he was. Now, he was not interested in fame. He didn't say, you know, what, what do I have to do to make my church bigger? What do I have to do to get more people to show up? He just remained faithful to the Word. And God did a work in the hearts of people all across Switzerland. He called them to genuine faith. He called them to true faith, not this false sort of uh, blind leap, just trust in the, in the pope or trust in the priest. No, you look at the Word of God and you believe and you surrender all. This is the kind of thing that he preached. He did not seek fame. He sought faith. Now, Zwingli and the other reformers certainly were not the first to do this, and they were by far not the best to do that. Who was that? That was Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ Himself is the ultimate example of someone who did not seek fame, but the genuine faith of those who listened to Him. And Jesus didn't seek popularity. Jesus didn't do what He had to do to get people to show up. Yes, many people came with the wrong reason. They followed Jesus or listened to His preaching for the wrong reason, sort of waiting for Him to finish so that they could get something healed or get some free food or whatever. But Jesus didn't do those things for fame or popularity. Jesus sought the genuine faith. Well, this is the message of this section. It's to demonstrate the, the fame of Jesus but to show us that he was not interested in fame, he was interested in the hearts of mankind. In fact, uh, look down at verse 26. The report of this went through all that district. So it gives us the first sign or a couple of signs here, the first section here, and the report of this went through all the district. Then you look at the, the next section, the next sign of this trio of signs. Verse 31, they went away and spread his fame through all that district. Verse 33, second half of the verse 33, and crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. This is a demonstration of the fame of Jesus spreading and spreading and spreading. But what Matthew is going to show us is that Jesus is not interested in fame for the sake of being famous. He's not, his objective was not fame. His objective was the heart of of man. And so when he begins to apply this and show us the meaning of this, he says that as Jesus looks at the crowds, he doesn't pat himself on the back and collect royalties. When Jesus looks at the crowds, he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. 
He looks even beyond their, their felt needs, their physical needs, their, their hunger and their, their ailments and their sickness and the death. He looks past all of that to their hearts and sees that these people need a shepherd. Verse 36, Jesus saw the crowds. He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So his heart was not for fame. His heart was not for a a wildly popular movement. His heart was not for a large church. His heart was not for that kind of popularity. His heart for the truth of the gospel to be imparted to the heart of people. He was so concerned with the true gospel being proclaimed to the heart of man that he, he told his disciples at the end of all this, this popularity and the comments about his popularity, he told them, we need people to go and take the truth. We need workers in this harvest. In fact, he would be so focused on this that eventually, in the next section, he would assign 12 men to go out and be his official spokesman in terms of the gospel. He chose these apostles to be his representatives, ones who would authoritatively speak on his behalf, write and guard the true gospel. And so he he knows that the true gospel is the only thing that will truly change the heart of people. And so he commissions his followers to do just that. Now, this is a vital message today, isn't it? I think many Christians, many pastors, many churches have this backwards. I think they they seek fame first. Let's get as famous and popular and stylish and attractive as possible, and then we can sort of slip them the mickey of the gospel. It's it's a, it, in the new term would be clickbait. Let's become as clickbait as possible. Let's get people to go to our website, to come to our church, as popular as possible. The old term is bait and switch. Then, you know, then we'll sneak the gospel in here and there. Let's become famous first. Not so for Jesus. His objective was not clickbait. He was not into a bait and switch. He wanted to be faithful to his calling, faithful to the gospel, and he wanted to call people to genuine, true surrender, true faith in him. Well, this story of these two daughters demonstrates a surprising source, a surprising people who, who come to Christ and who have that heart of faith. I mean, the surprising effect of, of the preaching of the gospel on these hearts. Now, if you're writing notes, maybe you want to write this down, a surprising source of true faith. Verse 18, while he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. Jesus is in Capernaum. If you remember, Jesus had been across the Sea of Galilee, but had returned to his home base. Capernaum was where he he based his ministry out of, at least for some time. Jesus had come back to Capernaum. Some things had happened. He had had some discussion. In fact, if you, if you go back up to the beginning, it says while he was saying these things to them, he had been discussing to some questions asking, uh, that were asked by the Pharisees and others that were standing there, and he began to answer these things. And in the middle of this is when this all happens. Now, there are a couple surprising aspects about this man who is demonstrating faith here. The first surprising thing, and I I think this is why Matthew puts the word behold in here. That's the surprise. Behold, what's surprising? Well, this is some kind of ruler. That's what it says. He's a a ruler there in Capernaum. means he's probably some kind of political leader, uh, which means in that day he would have been a religious leader as well. means he would have had position in the synagogue. If you look at the history of Israel, especially during the, the time between the Testaments, There would have been a close relation between uh, the elders in the synagogue and the elders of the city. In fact, they might have been the same people. You read some verses sometimes that that gets you this idea that the leaders in the synagogue, the leaders in worship, uh, the men who led the the synagogue would be the same men who who led the town. 
So, so this man had considerable power. He probably had some position. They probably would have called him rabbi if he was a teacher, so he probably was not a teacher. But he certainly had a prominent position in the synagogue. Mark tells us that, in fact, is what he was. He was a ruler in this area. His name, by the way, Mark tells us, was Jairus. Most rulers, when it came to Jesus, they did what powerful, wealthy people do in terms of Jesus. They stood on the periphery. Most of the scribes and the Pharisees stood on the outer edges. Most of them did not engage Jesus. They certainly wouldn't come to Jesus in need. Perhaps they stood out there and gossiped and observed and watched, and we know later on they began to stand on the periphery and and begin to plot how they could kill him. Most rulers, if they engaged Jesus, it was it was to accuse him, to, to embarrass him, to shame him in front of the crowd because they were jealous of his, his fame. Not so for this guy. Now, the first shocking thing is that he just goes right up to Jesus, and he is needy. God has orchestrated some circumstances in his life where his daughter is about to die or is dead, and this man is needy, and he comes straight up to Jesus. Well, really, that shows us really the second thing about this man, that he wasn't just coming up to Jesus for some superficial thing. He, he had genuine faith in Jesus. This would be much like the centurion who, whom Jesus was surprised about, the kind of faith, marveling at the kind of faith. And here's a man who's a ruler, and not only does he approach Jesus, it's clear in what he says here that he's a follower of Jesus. He kneels before the Savior. The ruler came in and knelt before him, and the word that's used there is not just a a typical word before, you know, he just kind of bowed or kind of showed some respect. He actually prostrated himself in worship. He worshiped Jesus. And he clearly believes that Jesus has the power over life and death. R.C. Sproul says it this way, It is clear, however, this man was not merely desperate. He was transformed. Notice what he did. He worshipped Jesus. Notice what he said. My daughter has just died, but lay your hand on her and she will live. This man recognized that Jesus was more than a prophet, more than a good teacher, more than a wise rabbi. Well before Peter, he confessed Jesus as the Son of God. This man had seen the truth. He knew that Jesus was God in the flesh. And he had the power not only to heal the living, but to raise the dead. I think this is why Matthew chose that word, behold. There's this ruler of all people. The rulers were the ones who accused Jesus and were jealous of Jesus and were, were constantly plotting to, to kill him and to, to, to shame him. And of all people, out of that group, comes a man who's desperate, and he's not just desperate, he's worshiping Christ. He's believing Christ. Now, before Jesus has a chance to go to his house and heal the ruler's daughter, Jesus heals another lady. He calls that lady daughter. I think that the message there is that Jesus sees everyone on the same plane. We're all the same, and we come before Jesus. We have the same needs. But the end of the story of Jairus and his sick daughter begins down in verse 23. Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. They laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Now, this is, sounds a little strange to us, but this is normal first century behavior when someone dies. When someone dies, you bring in, especially if you were a ruler and you had money, you would actually hire mourners. Some of this is overlap even to today's Middle Eastern practices. He probably had hired some mourners, and this kind of explains their their distance and their ability to mourn and then suddenly laugh and poke fun at Jesus. I mean, they weren't truly emotionally invested in this situation. They had been hired to do a job, and that is to come and pretend like they're really sad about this. And the more wealthy you were, more wealthy you were the more mourners you would hire. And clearly Jairus or his servants or his wife or somebody had, had gathered all these people in there to, to make all this mournful commotion, how sad they were to see this 
daughter pass. And Jesus comes in and says, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And uh, I had to pause right there because clearly this is a story of, of him raising some from the dead. Why would he go in and say, no, 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 she's just sleeping? Everyone laughs at him. Uh, I think it is because, I mean, most scholars here agree that Jesus is making a, a statement about his power to rise people from the dead. His power over dead people is akin to your power over a sleeping child to just go up and gently touch them and they wake up. That's the kind of power that Jesus had, and I think Jesus is making a statement about this. This, this girl was clearly, in this passage, was dead. The reason he says she's sleeping is that he has power over her as if that's all she were doing. The mourners laugh. They don't get it. They leave. They clearly don't believe what Jairus did. Jesus reaches down, takes her by the hand. The girl rises up from the dead. Indeed, he does have the very power that Jairus believed him to have. Indeed, he is the Son of God, and indeed, he is the Messiah. And the surprising thing is this man, this ruler, is the source of genuine faith. Again, very similar to the faith of the centurion, the surprising source of faith. And this gives us hope, doesn't it? We have various backgrounds. There isn't one year go by when I'm not sharing Christ with somebody, perhaps even someone who's, who's come to our church a little bit, and, and they sort of feel unworthy of salvation. And they say, you know, uh, I've done so much, or I do these things, and I just, you know, I, I just can't be saved. Maybe if I clean my life up first, and, and then I'd be a little more worthy. And, and my message is always the same. We're all unworthy. There's not one of us that's worthy of salvation. We all are at the same starting point. It's not that someone is further behind. We all start dead in our sin. And, and what's beautiful about the Bible is that over and over again, you see people who are surprising sources of genuine faith. They finally get it. They finally get, I have to put my trust and faith in Christ alone. It's not my religion. It's not my goodness. It's not the things I do. It's not my church attendance. I just trust simply in Christ. I give up. I surrender all. And it's that kind of faith that saves. This surprising truth, if you look through the history of mankind, the kind of people that God has saved have done things that are far more criminal than probably any of us in this room. God has reached down and changed their heart. They've repented of their sin. They've had faith in Jesus Christ. So you're not too far gone. There's nobody here who is if they want to repent and trust in Christ and believe in Him, you're, you're not too far gone. God can save you, even if you're a really surprising convert. Some of the most surprising converts are those of you who are like me, grew up in a Christian family, and everyone just assumes you're saved. And you have to have the humility to stand up and say, I, I've not been saved. I need to be saved. I humble myself, repent of my sin, follow Christ. All right, that's the story of the first daughter, and really it's a story about this, this ruler, Jairus, his faith. The second daughter, it is indeed about her faith. Look at verse 20, behold, here's that word again, behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. Point number two, a surprising spirit of true faith. By spirit, I mean attitude, I mean demeanor. Notice again, Matthew says, behold, this is a surprising thing that happens here. This is recorded in other gospels because it is such a surprising, strange thing that happens. Matthew's account here is a little bit abbreviated. What we can tell is that she had some kind of blood disease. It wasn't a life-threatening disease, but it did make her ceremonially unclean. If you were with us some years ago, we looked at Leviticus, and these Jewish legal designations of unclean and clean don't necessarily mean right and wrong. I mean, sometimes they are related to sin. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it seems kind of arbitrary. And the whole purpose that God gives it to the people of Israel so they can see the distance between themselves and God and can see how pure and holy and perfect God is. 
There were things that God required that would make them unclean, so they weren't necessarily unclean by sinning. This lady was not unclean because of her sin. She was unclean because of a disease. Not being ceremonially clean means she couldn't have partaken of the worship. She could sort of stand on the outside and, and look in. She couldn't attend. She couldn't tend to her sacrifices. She couldn't go down and visit and be a part of the temple worship. She had to sort of stand on the outside and wait until somehow God would allow her to worship him. She was permanently, in her mind anyway, permanently unclean. On top of this, we learned from Mark's gospel that she had spent a lot of money with doctors trying to be healed of this, all to no avail. What's surprising here, what's surprising here is her attitude, her spirit. For one thing, again, she genuinely believed in Christ, His divine power to heal her. She believed in, she knew this. This lady had so much belief in Christ, in His compassion, in His power, that she knew by touching just the hem of His garment that she would be made well. Another surprising aspect about this lady is that she did not come with a sense of entitlement. She didn't even speak to Jesus. She didn't do like the ruler who sort of waltz on up. And I don't know that it was... I don't think it was sinful for the ruler to waltz on up, but clearly the, the, the story here is about how humble this lady was, how demure this lady was. She had no sense of entitlement, so much so that she didn't even say anything to Jesus. She just reached out and touched his garment. No sense of entitlement. This is the opposite, isn't it, of the prosperity gospel? God owes us a good life. God owes us healing. God owes us wealth. Opposite of casual Christianity that says, well, if I do X, Y, and Z, God will, you know, bless me. Things should, should go, go good for me because, after all, I'm a pretty good servant. I give a little bit. That's a sense of entitlement. This little lady doesn't have that sense of entitlement. She's shockingly the opposite. The third surprising thing is what Jesus does. He senses her need. Again, Mark tells us that he feels, he knows what's happening with his divine power to heal. He can sense it, he understands it, and he senses power healing her. And then he says, daughter, indicating his love and care for her, daughter, your faith has saved you. And all your English translation says made you well, and certainly uh, that word, sozo, can be used for being healed. But I think it's interesting. Jesus doesn't use that term, your faith has made you well. That phrase, your faith has made you well, your faith has saved you for people who don't have faith. He healed other people who didn't have any faith. But he says to this lady, your faith has saved you. And quite possibly, and we don't know exactly how this happens. This is a little bit of a conjecture. Quite possibly, she had already been healed at this point, the, the moment she touched the garment, she could have been healed. It says in Mark, she, she could sense that she was being healed. And so when he says, your faith has saved you, maybe he's not even addressing, addressing the issue specifically of her ailment, but her life, her soul. He sees her genuine faith, and he says, you have been saved. This gets, it, gets us back to the main point. Jesus, without a doubt, was concerned about people's physical needs. He had compassion for people. He was moved by their physical needs. He wept over their physical needs. He addressed their physical needs. He helped them, but, but not... And he didn't do that, by the way, just for prophecy-fulfilling reasons. Oh, yeah, I've got to fulfill this role and heal people and do stuff because the prophets said I would. He does it because he genuinely is concerned about people. But without question... Without doubt, his greatest concern for people was that they have genuine faith in him. If people would only look to the good shepherd, if they would only reach out in genuine, full, repentant, committed faith, if they would only step out in genuine faith, not some sort of positive affirmation of Jesus, but, but genuinely turn to Christ and genuinely follow after Him and genuinely trust in Him and, and fashion their life after Him and study His words and genuinely get uh, 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 to ingesting what He's done and what He did in this world. That's genuine discipleship. That's true faith. 
This is what Jesus is after. So this brings us to a question as why did God bring each one of us here in this room today to hear a message about genuine saving faith? Perhaps many of you are already genuinely saved. You do have faith. But maybe this helps us realize Jesus' methods, Jesus' interests, your own interest in the heart of others, your own desire to, to continue in your own faith. But perhaps God has brought you here today because you've never had genuine faith in Christ. Maybe you've had some affirmation. Maybe you've looked at Jesus positively. Maybe you've had some sort of uh, emotional experience. But you've never turned away from your sin and your self-righteousness that you think is getting you to heaven. Turn away from it all and said, I surrender all. I have genuine faith. If you do that, behold, you can be saved today. Trust in Christ, have faith in Him, and you will be saved. Let's pray that God would work in our hearts even now. Father, we thank You for this time. We pray that You would indeed save souls even now. As we pray, Lord, I pray that they would cry out to You in repentance and faith and genuine profession I pray that you would give them the desire to do this. I pray that you'd make it clear to them what genuine faith is and help them reach out to you in that faith. Lord, all of us need to strengthen our faith. All of us need to trust in Christ more. So strengthen our faith today. Remind us of these things at the beginning of the year. Help us love you and worship you in this way. Father, I pray that you would Bless believers with a desire to share the truth, a desire to have an interest in people's hearts and their souls, not just their physical needs, but their souls. Help us to love you in this way. We worship you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Help us honor him today. I ask this in his name. Amen. Amen.